Welcome to Hosanna, the church where no perfect people are allowed. Meet Jesse. 15 minutes ago, she was so short-tempered with her children, she actually considered selling those naughty little kids to a circus. But she sure seems delighted now. Here's Paul. He doesn't know Genesis from Galatians. And he still thinks that the NIV and NLT are sandwiches like a BLT. But he's here with a million dollar smile. And what about Sam? Did you know he's wearing the same clothes he fell asleep in last night? <laughs> Even a little pungent. But he couldn't be more excited to have a seat in the house of the Lord. And why are all these people so happy to be here? Because at this church, there's no perfect people allowed. Is that a good take, guys? Is that good? Keeper? It's a whole lot of fun to come to church here, isn't it? One more time. Good job to the worship team. Good job, you guys. We all have bruises, and that's okay. That's what makes us human. It makes us three-dimensional. Welcome. Welcome to Hosanna. We're excited that you are here this morning. We believe the Lord led you here. Did I say that already? We mean that. And I just want to let you know, my name is Shay, and I am the, stu I am the Youth Ministries and Shakopee Campus Pastor. And it's my distinct privilege to welcome you here this morning, those of you that are in the CLC, and also those of you that are watching online as well. Welcome to all of the folks that are dialing in this morning. Hey, uh, we got word last night. I want to let you know something. We got word last night right before the service, right in the, this is, it's, it's too good to be true, right in the middle of the, of the Seahawks win over the Saints. Pastor Ryan Alexander and Jen Alexander had a baby boy, Zachary Hamilton Alexander. That kid came right in the middle of that game. There, there he is, and, and Ryan's got his Seahawks stuff going on, and mom and baby are doing fine, but dad's head has swelled to great, great, uh, great heights there, so... We're praying for him. Anyway, it's a, it's a big day, big day for those guys, and Pastor Ryan will be back with us soon, but congratulations to them. Um, also, while we're talking about babies, Hosanna, we are about to launch uh, a brand new campus, and um, that is coming March the 2nd. We've had a lot of folks saying, when, when, are, when is our first service is going to be, when are our first services going to be in Shakopee? In March 2nd. Uh, just a couple of weeks, just a, uh, a couple of months away, we are going to be opening our doors for the first time. We're so excited about this. I got to tell you, I want to give you a quick update. There's some footage that you can watch on the screen while I'm telling you this. The building is almost done. Uh, there's a lot of excitement going in. I was over there on Friday, and the trucks were there installing our new storefront sign. The thing is huge. It lights up. Uh, it, it's just getting exciting over there. The carpet's almost done. That means all they have to do is hang some doors and put up the sound system, and we're getting real close, folks. And anyway, it's exciting, and I just want to it's extend an invitation to you. Maybe you have thought about or been praying about uh, whether or not you want to be a part of that, I would just extend to you the invitation. We have a lot of room, a lot of opportunity for you to partner with us in launching a brand new site in Shakopee in Scott County. And if you're, in, if you're at all interested, I would encourage you to go to the website, hosannalc.org, and go to the impact part of our website to learn more information. Okay, we're done, but I'm still excited. I'm sorry. It's going to be a lot of fun. A, lot, a lot's going on. We're continuing this morning in our sermon series entitled, No Perfect People Allowed. No Perfect People Allowed. And I'm really enjoying this series. And in fact, we're pulling through. Pastor Bill last week did a great job at starting the series off for us. And he, he said something that we're going to pull through for the rest of the weeks that we're doing this. And here's the central idea. It goes like this. No one in the room is perfect. The only perfect thing in the room is God's perfect love for us. That's a great place to say amen. amen. But here's the deal. It's not easy to admit this, is it? I mean, I'll be the first one to line up and just tell you that it's hard sometimes to say 
that you're not that I'm not perfect, that I've got issues, that I got stuff going on, that what you see is not what all what you what all, always what you get, and that there's a backstory, there's something going on there, and and none of us really like to do that. In fact, in fact, uh, what what tends to happen sometimes is my wife and I will be sitting down over a candlelight romantic dinner, and she will say to me in a very sweet voice, um, Shay, you know what your problem is, and it, to which I I will usually say no, but I, I, I'm betting you're about to tell me. And, and then she says, um, you think you're perfect. And I just can't help myself. It comes out before I can grab it back. But I, I usually say to her, yes, I am, dear. And the faster that you learn that, the easier all of this will be for all of us. And then I quote to her a bunch of you know, Bible verses about wives submitting to husbands and, and how uh, you know, Sarah called Abraham Lord and all, you know, that good stuff. Did I mention that she's Italian? It, it, it doesn't go well for me when I do that. But none of us really like to admit that we're not perfect, that, that we don't like to kind of let others in. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. I think that all of us in the room, I really mean this, I think all of us in the room share at some level a fear. We all share in common a fear. And this is the fear that we share in common. That if we really were honest about who we really are, and we kind of opened up about that, and we really, let see pe- we really let people see what we're struggling with, we really let people see what our, our failures are, then we would be rejected, that people would reject us. And we share that fear in common, and it's, it's a real fear. That there's a chance that if I really told someone what's going on, or if I really told someone the way that I've messed up, then they would reject me. And here's the sad part. What I hope to be addressing today is not only do we project that on other people that they'll reject us, but sometimes what we do is we do the very same thing to God. And we feel like that we have to somehow clean up in order to be accepted by him. That we have to put on our best face. That we have to put on our best clothes. We have to put forth our best foot in order for God to finally accept us in some way. And some of us grew up that way. We grew up in a background that taught us that God was angry with us and that we better get things straight in order to be accepted by him. But my dear friends, my dear friends, please, please let this lean on your mind for a moment. God always has and always will called and invited imperfect people. What other choice does he have? (laughs) Have you read your Bible lately? If you read the stories in the scripture, you will see that over and over and over again, God calls the most scrupulous characters People who are womanizers, people who are thieves, people who are murderers, people who are liars. Over and over again, their stories are recorded for us to see that God takes the broken, the fractured, those that are down and out, the dregs of society, and he calls them out of where they are into a new life and new beginning. Did you know that this is the central message of the gospel? The central message of the gospel is not that you are basically good and you just need um, some help every now and then to just kind of will your way into being good enough. You're basically a good person. No. In fact, the heartbeat of the gospel is the opposite, that all of us are hopelessly broken and fractured on the inside and there's nothing we can do to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, that we need help and that God sent help in the form of his son, Jesus, to extend a hand of grace and mercy to us and invite us into a two-way relationship where the life of God changes us from the inside out. Here's the deal. The faster that you and I admit to and own up to the issues in our lives and the fact that we're not perfect, the faster God can do something about the mess. This is really what this theme verse that we're pulling through for the next four weeks uh, is is saying to us here, or the next three weeks. It says this in 1 John, as he's writing a letter, one of the disciples of Jesus, years later, is writing a letter to to one of the churches, and he says this, if we claim we have no sin, 
We are only fooling who? Ourselves. Come on, everybody around us knows our blind spots. They know our weaknesses. Even when we don't see them or refuse to acknowledge them, everyone around us sees us, sees it. And so John says if we claim we don't have any sin, brokenness, fracture, things going on, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in the truth. Verse 9 says, but if we confess our sins, if we come clean, if we own up to them, if we are honest about what's really going on, to him, to who, who is him, Jesus, if we confess our sins to him, he is, look, at, I love this, he is faithful and just to what? Forgive us, to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness or unrighteousness. In other words, he is faithful to, one translation says, continually, an ongoing process, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The good work that God has begun in you, the scripture says, he is faithful and just to complete it in you. He will not leave you where you are in your brokenness, in your fracture. He won't leave you in your mess, but he's faithful and just to pull us in his grace and mercy and unconditional love out of the spot we're in into the place called best, the place in the life that he has for you. This is true about Jesus, isn't it? All through the New Testament, we see him over and over again encounter people throughout his ministry that are broken and messed up. You know, it's, it's very interesting. Jesus did not hang out with the professional clergy of his day when he showed up. In fact, in Matthew chapter 9, the, the clergy were getting pretty upset about the people that Jesus hung out with because he had former prostitutes in his entourage. He had tax collectors in his entourage. He had uneducated fishermen in his, in his entourage. He had uh, zealots in his uh, entourage. He had all the people. If, if you were going to change the world and you were going to launch a campaign to change the world, who would you pick? I would go after like Harvard grads and stuff. But Jesus, I look at who he picked, and it's crazy. He, he picked all of the wrong people, but he knew what he was doing because those people would change history. And it gives me hope because if he picked them, then I think I got a chance to. One of these people that Jesus encountered and, and changed in such a very real way was an unnamed woman in John chapter 4. John chapter 4 tells the story of the woman at the well. Many of us in the room, we've heard this story before. Some of us, we've never heard the story. But for all of us, I hope that we hear something brand new today for us. Because as Jesus has an encounter with this woman at the well, it changes everything in her life. I want you to see it. John chapter 4 is where we'll be today. Now, it's 30 verses long, so I'm not going to take time to read all of the verses, but there are a few that I'll pick out for you. But you can follow along if you have your Bible. John chapter 4. And I want to give you kind of set the table of what's going on here, give you the outline, tell you the story. Jesus was in Judea. And he had ticked off the Pharisees, and they, they, were, they were scheming against him. And so he says to his disciples at the beginning of John chapter 4, he says, look, let's get out of here. It's heating up. Uh, I don't want to get arrested or something, so let, let's go. Let's go back to Galilee. And Galilee was the region where he grew up. It was around the, the Sea of Galilee. And so they began a journey. Now, this journey was about a 70-mile walk, okay, 70 miles from Judea back to Galilee. And they cut through Samaria. And they were, they were going through Samaritan villages, and the story says that they came to a village of Sychar. Now, I tried to find all the information I could about Sychar, but here's the thing about Sychar. Sychar was a, a tiny village, and we, all, we don't know much about it, but it was a very insignificant tiny village. But one thing that was special about Sychar is they had Jacob's well there. No, Jacob's well was kind of a landmark. It was a famous landmark. It had been there for centuries, um, and it was the well where Abraham's grandson, Jacob, met his wife. And, and it was an important landmark. And the Samaritans, oh, they, they were kind of on the outs with the Jews because they were half-breed, they were half-Jewish, and they were half-other things. And the Jews discriminated against them, and they, they called them, they thought they were compromisers, and so they didn't want to have anything to do with them. And so it was a miracle that Jesus would even go through um, this region anyway. A lot of Jews would go around, and it would double the time that it took you to get back to Galilee. But Jesus goes right through, and he's, he's at this well. Now, the story, John is very careful to record um, some details that mean 
mean something here, and I want to show them to you. The first thing that is significant to me is that when Jesus gets to the well, he's sitting there. John is careful to record for us that he is left alone. He's left alone. He sends his disciples into this small village of Sychar, and he says, go get food for us. And, and John also records that Jesus is weary. He's tired. He's sitting by the well. Why is he tired? Probably because he just walked about 35 miles. And so he's sitting at the well, and he's by himself. Now, here's what's significant to me, is almost every other story of Jesus encountering people throughout the scriptures, he's with other people. His disciples are there. But in this particular story, it's just him and this woman who's about to enter into the scene. That's it. It's very telling of the heart of God that even towards this woman, when nobody's there to watch, he still ministers to this woman. I want you to see what happens. So this, this woman walks into the picture. Jesus is by himself. And, and Jewish men would not have talked to any women publicly, much less uh, uh, a, a Samaritan woman. Jesus, as a Jew, would not have addressed her. So it was very strange to her. It's kind of a tense moment. She sees this man sitting at the well. She doesn't recognize him. She doesn't know who he is, but she knows he's Jewish, and, and, but she's thirsty, and so she makes her way over to the well anyway, and she's not even going to say anything to him. And she's about to get water out of the well, and Jesus literally says to her, woman, give me something to drink. He was from the south. He used his, his manners there, I guess. And, and give me something to drink. And this, this woman looked at him and said, hey, you're a Jew. I'm, I'm a Samaritan. Why are you even talking to me right now? And Jesus says to her, when she says that to him, she, he says, if you knew who was standing in front of you, you would ask me for something to drink because I have living water. And then the woman, she still doesn't know who this is. She has no idea who she's talking to. And she says back to him, she's kind of feisty, this woman. She's back to him, you don't even have a rope to get water. What are you talking about? You're going to give me something to drink. At which point, Jesus in verse 13, I want you to see something. He says this to her. Anyone who drinks this water out of this well will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water that I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. And then this woman replies to him. Please, sir, the woman said, give me this water. Then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. And so this woman, which probably all of us would have done as well, he's offering water that never runs dry. Water that if you drink it, you will forever be satisfied. She says to them, okay, well, if you have this kind of water, then give it to me. I think she's being a little sarcastic here. Give it to me, and, and then I won't have to come back here anymore and get water. Now, what Jesus says next is fascinating. He is a master of influence. He is a master of stepping, sidestepping people's safety nets and the walls that they've erected in their lives for safety. And here's what he says. Watch this. This is important. He says to her, she says, give me this water. He says to her, go get your husband. It's weird. But something very powerful is happening here. We're going to look at this. The woman answers honestly back to him and says, I don't have a husband. To which Jesus replies, I know, right? You've had five, and the one that you're with is not your husband. Now, the next thing that comes out of this woman's mouth is pretty obvious. I think it's kind of like, okay, Captain, obvious. But here's what she says. You must be a prophet. To which I say, you think? <laughs> you must be a prophet. So when she realizes that he's a prophet and that he just exposed, you know, how, that's kind of weird. You don't just meet somebody and go, so how many times have you been married before? That would be a little, little you know, socially awkward. But that's what Jesus did. He went right, he cut right to the chase. And, and she looks at him and says, you must be a prophet. And, and then she gets into this religious debate. She tries to pull Jesus into a religious debate, which, again, she doesn't know who she's talking to. And so uh, it's, it's, she's, just, it, she's in a hard way. She's about to lose this battle. And she said, you Jews, you worship over there. We worship over here as Samaritans, and, and I think we're right. But Jesus responds to her. He, he basically says, look, you don't know what you're talking about, but the time is coming. Indeed, it's here now. When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking. You see this? The Father is looking. He's looking for those who will worship him that way. Look at the next verse. For God is spirit, so those who worship him 
must worship him in spirit and in truth. The next thing that the woman says changes her life forever. She says to him, I've heard there's a Messiah coming. And at that moment, Jesus reveals himself to her and says, I am he. I want you to see what this woman's response was. The woman left her water jar beside the well, ran back to the village, telling everyone, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. The rest of the story goes that Jesus and his disciples stayed with these folks for another three days ministering to them. And that's how an entire village came to know the Lord. So let's talk, about this, let's talk about this story for just a moment. It's a fascinating story. And there's three primary things that I want to pull out because I think they, they really speak to us, even today and what we're, we're, we're going through. The first thing that I want you to see about the story is there is a central piece of equipment that the entire story is told around. What's that, what's that, that central piece? You tell me. It's the well. The well. Over and over, it's like this word play is going back and forth, and Jesus is using the well to get this woman's attention and to break down religious and social barriers, and he's, he's sidestepping her prejudices. He's sidestepping the walls that she's erected in her life, and he gets to the very, cuts to the chase, to the very fact that this woman has been married for five times, and the man she's with now is not even her husband. It's all centered around a well. It's fascinating to me that what Jesus does is the, the first thing that he says when she asks for water that he has is he brings up her husband. What's he doing? What's he doing? I think what Jesus is doing is he is exposing in this woman this. Woman, your entire life you've been going to the well of marriage and relationships in order to satisfy and feed your soul, but you are consistently being left thirsty, broken, and worse off than the one before. And now you're in a relationship and you're not even married to that man. The first thing I want you to see about this story that we can learn from this story is this. Our wells leave us thirsty, but he has the well that never runs dry. We might say it this way. Our wells leave us thirsty, but Jesus is the well that never runs dry. Blaise Pascal, he said it this way. He was a 17th century mathematician and philosopher. He said this, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man which cannot be filled by any created thing, but only by God, the creator, made known through Jesus. In other words, what Blaise Pascal is getting to is there is a missing piece in all of us. It's an itch we can't scratch. It's, it's a gnawing that we can't quite put our finger on. That no matter what we consume, no matter what we get, no matter how big our house is, no matter what cars we drive, no matter what job we have or what relationship we're in or out of, no matter what how much our circumstances are perfect or imperfect, there always is something that seems to be missing. And it's a shape that has been placed in us by our creator. And Genesis chapter 1 says it this way. That when Genesis 1, 2, and 3 tells the story of how Adam and Eve were created by God and they, were, they experienced God's glory on a regular basis. It says that he would come in the cool of the afternoon and he would walk with Adam and Eve. They enjoyed this two-way exchange, this two-way relationship with their creator. And sin then entered into the garden when Adam and Eve rebelled, and it separated them from their creator. And from that time until now, all of humanity has been pursuing material things, pursuing relationships, pursuing money, pursuing status, pursuing power, pursuing accomplishment in order to fill the void that was left by God's glory not being there anymore. My dear friends, you and I are created in such a way that there's only one thing that will satisfy us really, and that is God's presence in our life. Maybe you're like me, and from time to time, you get tricked into thinking, I just need that thing, or I just need more of this, or I just need this situation to change, and then I'll finally be happy. But all week, what's been 
just kind of ringing around in my heart. And what I feel like this, this has done for me in studying this is just Jesus reminding me, Shay, I am the only well that never runs dry. You know what my prayer has been this week? It's kind of been apologizing a little bit to the Lord and saying, Lord, I've been, again, I've been duped into thinking that I need this to happen or I need this thing or I need that amount of money or I need to drive this or whatever in order to be happy. And I have neglected coming to the only thing, the only well that never runs dry. My sense is today that there are those of us in this room that can identify with that. And maybe even some of us we're in here today and we are a huge mess because we have only pursued more and more and more. And every time we get our hands on the next thing, it only leaves us more messed up than we were before. And today you're sitting here and you're a huge mess and you don't quite know what to do. My dear friends, may I simply in extend an invitation to you. What you're missing is Jesus. And if you will call out to him and if you will ask him, he will meet you more than halfway and extend to you the water of life that truly satisfies, cleanses your sin, and gives you a brand new start. I believe that. He alone is the well that never runs dry. Second thing that I think we could pull out of this story is this thought that, that uh, Jesus says in verse 23 when he says, the Father is looking for those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. How we could say that is, is maybe this way in your bulletin notes, if you're, if you're taking notes, is it, this. The Father doesn't expect perfection. Rather, he asks for honest worship. The Father doesn't expect perfection. Rather, he asks for honest worship. This is how Eugene Peterson in the Message Bible interprets that particular verse in this story. This is, this is what he says Jesus was getting at. It's who you are and the way you live that count before God. Your worship must engage your spirit in the pursuit of truth. That's the kind of people the Father is looking out for. Those who are simply and honestly themselves before him in their worship. Those that are simply and honestly themselves before him in their worship. Did you know, did you know that this place should be a place where you feel safe? And honest. You, you know, uh, we were sitting together as a, as a teaching team recently, and we were talking about this series, the one that we're in. And we wanted to, right off the bat, just knowing that we have a lot of guests and visitors coming in at, after the first of the year, we wanted right off, to a bat, right off the bat to establish that we want Hosanna as a community to be a community that is a safe place that gives grace to one another. In fact, this is how we said it. We said, what's the win? What do we want people to see and feel and know and do at the end of this sermon series? And here's what we came up with. It was simply this. We want people to know. We want you to know. We want to know that God is a safe place. He is a refuge. And not only is God a safe place, but this place as well should be a safe place. And that you don't have to clean up. You don't have to get your act together before you come here. But come as you are. He loves you. He loves you just the way you are, but too much to leave you that way. And I promise you, if you start hanging out with us, then you will see things in your life begin to change. We hear the stories all the time. That's not just about Hosanna. That's just about being in a Christ-centered community where we're encouraging one another and giving one another space to grow and giving one another space and mercy for the rough edges to be filed away and for the Holy Spirit to do something in our life and to change us from the inside out. It's why we have all of our programs that we offer in care, like Celebrate Recovery. Life hurts. God heals for teenagers. We have all kinds of things that happen throughout the week. I would encourage you, if you're here today and you say, Shay, I'm a wreck, I would encourage you, get some prayer in the prayer chapel. Go by the care booth, see what we offer. But we want to be, we, are, we really want to be a community where we encourage, here it is, honest worship to the Father. It's hard to do sometimes. I know it's hard to do sometimes. Sometimes we feel the pressure of we got to put on our best face to go to church. We fight in the car all the way here, but as soon as we get in the parking lot and the door opens, everything is gravy. 
I know. Come on, I think more than, as a pastor, I feel that big time. I, I know I run into most of you in Target sometimes, but you guys don't say anything. You just want to see if, if, if I'm yelling at my kids or whatever. So I want to smack my son, but I can't because I know there's Hosanna people in there. I know, I know the pressure. We all feel it. But I just, what we want to say in this series is this. This is a safe place where we give one another grace and we don't have to have it all together. But we're on a journey together. We're on a journey. We're all headed to where God wants us to be. And if you're interested in being on that journey, then this is the place for you no matter what your starting point is. Amen. The third and last thing I want you to see about this story, and it's, it's a great story. It's my favorite part of the whole story. John records some very specific details here. But when this woman hears that Jesus is the Messiah, the first thing that she does is, what does she do? She drops her water bucket, the very thing that is the, the, the um, example that Jesus is using to tell her that she, had, she has five husbands and that she's going to the wrong well. So she, in, in, in what's happening here, it's like a symbol. She's dropping that pursuit. She leaves it. And what does she do? She runs back to the village, and she tells everybody, come and see. Think about this. How long was her conversation with Jesus? Five, ten minutes? It wasn't very long. But here's the thing. That is a different woman returning to the village than the one who showed up in the first place. Do you understand? Do you see this? One five-minute encounter with Jesus face-to-face changed her life. Here's the third thing I would tell you about this story. It's in your notes. You don't have to be perfect to make an impact. You don't have to be perfect. I would say it this way too. You don't have to be perfect to have a purpose. I think sometimes we get, we get scared or, or intimidated by the idea, God can't use me. Do you know all the junk that's going on in my life right now? But here's what I want to say to you. What, what village is waiting on you just to come back and share your story? Come and see a man that has told me everything I've, all, I've ever done. He's the Messiah. Here's what I want to say. This woman had five husbands. How big was this village? <laughs> it, I, it wasn't a big one. We know this, right? So she had quite the reputation. These, these people knew who this woman was. But by the time she got back in just a five-minute encounter with Jesus, everything about her was changed enough that apparently her credibility, something changed enough that they were willing to, to extend some credibility her way, and they came out and s- to see who Jesus was. I love this part because here's what it says to me, is that God can use even somebody like me. With all of my imperfections, with all of my brokenness, with all of my insisting to my wife that I'm perfect, With all of that stuff, still, God can use me. He can give me a purpose. And I just want to say, I think there are some of us that are here today, that's what's been missing in your life, is an encounter with Jesus. In your life, if you felt aimless and you felt like it doesn't make sense, and what's the point? Is it even going to matter that I was here when I'm gone? And I want to say, my friend, he's offering new life. He's offering to you satisfaction in your soul. He's offering to you forgiveness. He's offering healing for your brokenness. He's offering to you purpose for your life. Who is that? That's Jesus. And the same Jesus that's in this story talking to this woman at the well is here with us today as we talk about him in the word. Scripture says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is alive. He is with us. And he is extending to you the same invitation that he gives to this woman. Ask of me, and I will give you living water that will satisfy you forever. Let's pray together. Lord, all over the room today, I'm with great friends and great people that have gathered to come and be in your presence today, Lord. 
That's a huge signal that we, the fact that we're here this morning, Lord, that says something. And so no matter how imperfect the room is today, we pray that you would reveal to us the perfect love of the Father that is unconditional and meets us right where we are. We don't have to clean up to come to you, Lord. We just have to be honest with what's going on. And so, Lord, today we do that. We come to you. We surrender our lives, our hearts to you. We fess up. We come clean. Lord, we're broken. We got issues. We got stuff that nobody knows about, Lord, going on. But we ask that you would forgive us. You know what's going on. We confess those things to you this morning. Extend your grace and love and mercy to this place. Build a community of people that have centered around you, Lord. We're growing together and on the journey together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our prayer partners are coming forward. They'll be at the front here today. If you've had something stir in your life and you want some prayer, I want to encourage you to come forward and get some prayer. Would you please stand with me this morning? It's been a great day in the house of the Lord. Here's what I believe. I believe this week is going to be one of your best ever. God bless you. Go in peace. May God's grace be upon you to love and serve the Lord. We'll see you next weekend.